he is particularly interested by the spreading of misinformation in society and why people accept scientific evidence, for example, surrounding vaccinations or climate science. He has published more than 200 scholarly publications, and he has also contributed to 90 opinion pieces to the global media on issues related to climate change, uh, climate change skepticism, and the coverage of science in the media in general. In 2019, he received a Humboldt Research Award from the Humboldt Foundation in Germany. So without any further uh, notice, uh, welcome Professor Lewandowski. Well, thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Let me uh, share. Oh, just a comment for the public. Professor Lewandowski will pause in the middle of his talk to answer questions from the public. So I strongly encourage you to send your questions throughout the talk. Do not wait till the end so that when we pause, there's already material for discussion. Have a good talk. Indeed. And if I'll try and monitor it. And if anything pops up that's really exciting or if it's clear to me that I wasn't sufficiently clear, then I'll answer it straight away. My plan is to talk for about 30 minutes roughly, then take a 10 minute discussion break and then resume with another 25 minutes of content followed by more Q&A. So I'm looking forward to discussing these issues with you. <clears throat> so to set the context, let's talk briefly about something most of you probably already know, which is that a lot of people have said we live in a uh, post-truth world in which uh, facts and evidence no longer have the politi political currency that they should have in a democracy. And it's easy to illustrate this using the previous American president uh, who made more than 30,000 uh, false or misleading claims while in office, or well, that's equivalent to about 21 per day, according to uh, fact checkers. Now, um, that's perhaps a problem. And here's another problem that to my mind is is really the, the, the bigger one. And that is that um, his approval ratings throughout his presidency were remarkably static. I mean, they were never very high, but they were also never terribly low. And within his own party, uh, Donald Trump never had any approval less than 77%. Not only that, about three quarters of Republicans throughout his presidency have considered him to be honest. So here we have what I think is a, is a quite a remarkable thing. We are having a leading politician of the leading Western democracy with an unparalleled record of falsehoods, not paying a political price for that, and indeed being considered honest by his own partisans. Now, what does that have to do with climate change? Well, quite a bit, as it turns out, because uh, among many other things that Donald Trump was uh, making false claims about, he also basically thought that global warming was some sort of a conspiracy, uh, including something made up by the Chinese. I, I don't quite know how that works, but nonetheless, he was happily tweeting uh, something like 40 or 50 false statements about climate change throughout his presidency. So climate change, to my mind, or climate denial, which is what I want to talk about this morning, um, is intimately linked, uh, in my mind, to the post-truth world and politicians who have a particularly challenged relationship with the truth. Now, uh, what are the consequences of that? Well. At first glance, actually, if you look at the data for the US public acceptance of climate change, the picture isn't too bad. These are data from last year, the um, uh, annual report by researchers at uh, Yale and George Mason University. And what you can see here is that over time, arguably, uh, acceptance of climate change as being the result of human activities has actually gone up and the corresponding uh, view that it is naturally caused has declined slightly. So that is sort of good news, but if you look at it more carefully, then we're just barely back to where we were in 2009 in terms of acceptance. So we haven't really gathered that much uh, steam uh, in terms of moving ahead with public opinion or maybe moving ahead with policy. 
Now, what I'm going to focus on is um, climate denial today. And um, the very first thing I'm going to talk about is what I call the supply side of denial. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is that when people are questioning science, there, there are basically two parties involved in that. On the one hand, you have the people who are, who are delivering information that is counter to the scientific evidence. And on the other hand, um, you have people who are consuming that. So I think of it as a market that has a supply side and a demand side. So first thing I wanna do in the first half of my talk is talk a little bit about the uh, supply side, starting out with the infrastructure, just a brief sketch of how climate disinformation is disseminated uh, in the United States. But of course, then from there on, it bleeds out uh, to the rest of the world. Now, one thing we know for sure um, is that this dissemination of disinformation is well organized. Um, we know who the actors are. There's research done by sociologists on this. For example, Robert Broly has shown that um, taken as a whole, the annual income of conservative think tanks in the United States that is engaged in denial is around $900 million a year. Now, that doesn't mean all that money is spent on denial because these think tanks also have other agendas. However, it is indicative of how much money is being spent to thwart climate action. Uh, what Robert has also shown in another paper is the amount of money that's being spent lobbying against climate change in Congress. And the figure he came up with for this 17-year uh, period is $2 billion. So we're talking about a lot of money that is being spent on uh, climate denial. And how does this work? What are the networks? What are the uh, consequences of all this money being spent on effectively disinformation, as we'll, we'll see in a moment. Well, Justin Farrell from Yale University has done some really fascinating work on this, looking at the dissemination network of climate contrarian information. And specifically, what he looked at was, you know, about four and a half thousand individuals belonging to 164 different organizations and how they all hang together. What I'm showing you here is this network analysis of connections between these actors. And uh, one of the things you can do with network analyses, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do, but one of the interesting things you can do is to compute the centrality of a unit. So a person or an outfit, a think tank, some other lobbying institute, whatever it is, you can compute how central it is to the network. When you do that, then it turns out that those uh, agents of whatever variety who receive funding either from Exxon or the Koch brothers are more central than people who do not receive that funding. So uh, if nothing else, that tells us uh, that um, the money being spent uh, by these two out two organizations is effective because it puts people more in the center of this dissemination network. Now, what does that dissemination network do? What are the consequences of that? Well, uh, this is when you turn to the analysis of the documents uh, published by these various organizations. And when you then look at the semantic similarity between those contrarian texts and public output, then you find that over time there's been an increase. Um, so, on the left, we have the similarity defined by computational means. I don't want to go into the details, but the similarity between contrarian literature and what is being reported in the news media, that's been shown to increase significantly over time. Indeed, so has the content of American president's speech. It has become increasingly similar to contrarian content. So one way in which you can interpret this is by saying um, that the contrarian discourse has been effective in influencing how 
uh, the president and how the news media talk about uh, climate change. Now, that uh, dissemination is aided by the fact that the media sometimes engage in what I would consider to be false balance. Why do they do that? Well, balance is a journalistic norm. If you go to journalism school, you become a journalist, then the idea of balance is, is very central to your uh, training. And that is perfectly legitimate in a democracy. You should report the balance of opinion, and you shouldn't uh, favor one opinion unduly over another. However, I would argue it's different in scientific situations where what should matter is the balance of evidence, not the balance of opinion. Now, it turns out that um, initially, when I say initially, I mean like, you know, about 20 years ago or so up till then, initially the American media gave equal um, balance to contrarians and scientists. Um, now that to my mind is a false balance because it creates the appearance of a balanced scientific debate where in fact there is none. I mean, you know, there, there is no scientific debate about the fundamentals of climate change. Of course, scientists debate everything else, but not the core tenets of uh, the fact that the globe is warming from uh, fossil fuel emissions. Now that has improved in credit to a lot of media around the world that has improved. However, if you then quantify how much airtime or print inches are given to contrarian voices, then you find that the very few scientists who are opposing the scientific consensus are given disproportionate exposure. There are certain names you hear in the media over and over again, even though they're scientifically you know, either irrelevant or, or not considered particularly credible by their colleagues, they are given more exposure than the far larger number of mainstream scientists. Likewise, press releases um, from business coalitions are finding more uptake than press releases from scientific organizations or NGOs that are advocating uh, uh, climate mitigation. So the media still has some way to go, in my opinion, depending on what your model is of what the media should do. But if you're assuming that they should reflect the state of the science, well, then they've got a little bit of work to do. Uh, I think there, there's very little uh, question about that. Now, if you're interested in everything I've just talked about, then one of the sources, I mean, there's lots of stuff out there, but if you feel like it, here is a uh, report that some colleagues and I wrote a couple of years ago. It's available at that link, which I just put um, in the chat. You can download that, and there's a lot more detail in there, in particular sources to uh, uh, some of the issues I've talked about. So now what I want to do is, having set the context of denial, now what I want to do is I want to turn from the sort of macro picture to a uh, sort of more individually focused analysis of how people respond to um, climate denial and what techniques specifically are being used, what argumentative techniques are being used uh, by people who are denying the scientific consensus. Now, this graph here is taken from John Cook, who will be talking to you late this afternoon, Canadian time. Um, who's developed this classification of science denial called flick, fake experts, logical fallacies, impossible expectations, cherry picking and conspiracy theories. They're all super interesting, really great research going on along those, those lines of the classification. Unfortunately, I've only got time to talk about one. So what am I gonna talk about? I'm gonna talk about uh, cherry picking as a technique of um, uh, science denial. Now, uh, at this point, this is the one sort of uh, drawback of Zoom. I can't ask you to all raise your hand, but um, why don't you pop something in the chat and tell me what you think you're looking at here. If you can, um, if you can recognize this picture, 
just um, no one recognizes that. Aha, yes, Mona Lisa. Very good. Very good. Yep, yep. Everybody agrees. Ah, from the Louvre. Yes. A collage. Joconda. Ah, yes. Right. Ah, very clever. I knew that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a nickname for her, isn't it? All right. That's fine. Good. Let's take a quick break. Now I'm going to ask you the same question. What are you looking at? Um, it's an open question. I'm actually, this is an experiment. I'm asking you uh, to tell me. Now, of course, no one wants to tell me because you think there's a trick. Ah, <laughs> yes, somebody is very clever. Ah, somebody discovered Mr. Bean. Well, I put Mr. Bean in there. And just to, to clarify, uh, there's no Mr. Bean here. It's just the Mona Lisa. Now, it's still the Mona Lisa to absolutely everybody except a climate denier who will spot Mr. Bean and then say, oh, yeah, no, that's not the Mona Lisa. That's an illustration uh, of uh, cherry picking where you're looking at one data point that you like while ignoring everything else. Here's just one of you know, countless examples from a, a British newspaper from some time ago uh, when you know, this argument was made that climate models are wrong, they got everything wrong, and scientists never knew this because they're just not smart enough to pick up on this until the global temperatures drop 0.7 degrees, equivalent to their entire net rise in the 20th century. Oh, yeah? Well, this is, you know, the global temperature series from these are NASA's GIS data from 1880 through nearly 20, uh, 2020, not quite. Uh, and 0.7 degrees is, is that much on this scale. This is drawn to scale, uh, 0.7 centigrade, not Fahrenheit. So where is that decline? I mean, well, it's nowhere if you look at the data at an annual level. If you look at a month to month variation with a lot of random variation superimposed on the long-term trend, then yes, here he is. You have found your Mr. Bean that you can now write about in the Daily Telegraph. Um, that's just one example of how, I mean, yeah, well, I've been studying this stuff for a while and, and it's, uh, well, if it weren't sad, it would be highly amusing how the game is being played because uh, these people are very dedicated finding these, these data points they like. Uh, and, and studiously ignoring the signal that's anywhere else. Now, the problem with that is though, how, how can we adjudicate this? How can we uh, be sure that, that you know, the scientists <laughs> interpret the data correctly and the contrarians are not? Well, um, it's a little difficult to do that because when society is so polarized to the point where 20% of Americans think that climate science, you know, is just a hoax perpetrated by scientists who want to spend money, taxpayer money, how do you adjudicate that? Well, my contribution to this has been to, to try on, on several occasions to create a blind test. In other words, to present experts with stimuli that they couldn't or didn't identify or didn't know refer to climate data. And to illustrate what I mean by that, I would present my experts, either statisticians or um, economists, so two professional groups that are very much uh, uh, attuned to um, dealing with data, I would present them with this sort of comment which is a translation of verbatim content from climate contrarian material, but translated into either economic data or into, in this case, uh, population data. And here's a guy saying, you know, our country's rural population is growing, not shrinking. Almost all of the rural regions in the country are now gaining population. That was a translation of a, a blog post that actually dealt with the mass balance of glaciers. I'm making the claim here that most glaciers, well, rural regions, uh, are gaining mass balance. And I would then show the experts the graph that explained what was really happening. 
And again, this was labeled as village population. And you can see that most of the villages were losing population, only some of them were gaining it. The graph actually refers to glacial mass balance. And of course, most glaciers are shrinking, very few are gaining mass. And then I'd ask the experts to say, well, you know, how did the data relate to the claim? Is the claim correct? Is it accurate? Should it be used for policy? Um, so I asked people a whole bunch of questions about the data, combined it into a correctness score, and then uh, looked at what the experts thought. Now, what I haven't told you yet is that the same experiment also had mainstream scientific statements some of the time accompanying the same data. So that would be the interpretation from IPCC reports and so on. Um, and if you average across the various different scenarios, then what you find is a, a clear endorsement, um, a positive number, very clear endorsement of the mainstream scientific statements and an equally clear and quite strong rejection of the contrarian interpretations. In other words, if, if you have experts look at what contrarians say about the data in a context where they don't know it's about climate change, the experts say, well, this is, this is you know, rubbish, basically. They're saying, no, it's not adequate. It's misinterpretation of the data. It's not uh, relevant for uh, policy advice. So that, to my mind, is, is important to have some, some independent means of establishing that really when we're talking about denial, we are talking about denial, not what they claim to be talking about, which is skepticism. Well, no, skepticism would show up like that in a blind expert judgment. So now, what are the consequences of that denial uh, psychologically? Now I'm gonna look at this in two, two different ways. The, the first one is looking at the effect of denial on the public. By that, I mean the average person uh, on the street. Now, <clears throat> uh, what we know from a number of studies, I'm citing two of them here, is that exposure to misleading contrarian interpretations um, along the lines just discussed, just as I've shown you those graphs, if you translate similar statements into an experiment um, and then see what effect that has on people's attitudes towards climate change, then you find that there is a significant decline. In fact, a recent review that just came out a few weeks ago by Rode and colleagues did a meta-analysis of, in this case, 27 effect sizes from 14 different studies, trying to ascertain, well, how big of an effect um, is um, uh, the um, negative effect of being exposed to misinformation? And the answer is, you know, the, the value is minus 0.29. That's sort of a little bigger than small, but it's not quite medium. So it's a smallish uh, effect size, but it is quite reliable. And also, what may be more of a concern is, well, this is concerning, period. But what might be also concerning is that it is bigger than positive interventions. In other words, it is much easier to reduce people's acceptance of the science by a certain amount than it is to, to, to boost it by providing positive information that is underscoring the scientific consensus. Um, now, there can be all sorts of reasons for that, but you know, I, it's, it's important to keep in mind how damaging this sort of denial can be. And there's empirical evidence for that, uh, that that has, has some effect. Now, the other thing I'm gonna tell you about um, is something that is <laughs> uh, quite controversial and that's perfectly fine. Um, and that is the, the assumption that some colleagues of mine and I have made that some of that denial has seeped into the scientific community. Now, I wanna illustrate that using this famed pause in global warming which no one talks about anymore because it's well and truly over. And anybody who would claim there's a pause now would, would not go very far. But 
couple of years ago, a few years ago, there was a lot of talk about the pause in global warming. Global warming had stopped, apparently. Yeah, well, it hasn't, of course, but there was a time when if you were clever, you could pick the start date and an end date, you know, just a brief period of warming, and you could claim, yeah, okay, over that time period, there was no warming from beginning to end. Now, of course, as usual, this was all cherry picked. Uh, you, you move the begin and end year by one year, and then boom, it becomes a significant slope again. So it was always misleading. Uh, I know that again because of another blind test where I presented economists with this idea of the pause at a time when it was ongoing in the middle of this, you know, pause prime time around 2012, 2014, roughly. I can't remember when I collected the data. But um, I did the usual thing, as I've just explained. Uh, experts were presented with uh, uh, the temperature data dressed up as world agricultural output. And then they were uh, presented with a statement made by a contrarian in, in, the, in the media saying, hey, there's a problem with growth and output. Well, actually, you said there's a problem with global warming. It stopped in 1998. There is no trend. And three quarters of the experts, not knowing that this was climate data, said that's ill informed or misleading. Two thirds nearly thought it was fraudulent to, to make that claim. So, you know, that claim of a pause was not, didn't really sit with experts in a blind test. And yet, and this is quite interesting to my mind. <laughs> There's been hundreds of peer reviewed articles been written about the pause in climate science among climate scientists. So the question then is that's sort of puzzling. Um, if there is no pause, why is everybody talking about it? Well, the, the claim that some of my colleagues and I have made is that this politically motivated agenda setting talk about a pause may have actually got scientists to think, well, maybe there is a pause and we have to look at this. Now, I know because I worked with climate scientists um, uh, day in, day out, um, some mysterious thing has just, I don't know if you can see that there's, sorry, I'm having some, Something appeared on my screen that shouldn't be there. And I don't know why, um, but never mind. Hang on, I need to. Well, okay. Can, is there a box on top of the screen for you? Yes. Oh gosh, then I have to get rid of it. Okay. Yeah. There, there's a cancel button. Uh, on yeah, I know, the, except uh, I can't get my mouse there and it's not responding. Uh, but what I will do, I know where it's coming from. It's um, my dictation software, which I've just tried to quit. That's never happened before. Oh, it needs to be closed before. I tell you what, I'm going to stop sharing and I'll, I'll fix it and then I'll come right back with that. Well, it's easier said than done because my mouse disappeared. That is so annoying. Okay. Well, that's completely new. I learn something new every day, but. Uh, well, I'm getting. Getting to the new option now. Just going to use the task manager. Bingo, I think. Right. That's Okay. Bonjour, Rodis, Etienne à l'appareil. 
Je voulais juste savoir si vous savez à quelle heure elle va arriver avec mon frère. OK. I now have enough. Can you hear me, Fernanda? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Actually, I wanted to ask you if you think this is a good moment to uh, ask, uh, respond to participants' questions or how's your presentation? Well, at the moment, no, because um, now my PowerPoint has frozen. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> so I'm now, um, for reasons that are not clear to me, uh huh. I need to kill that as well and then restart and hope that my, well, it's worse than that. I may have to re, okay, I may have to restart Zoom. So, <laughs> sorry, never had that. Actually, I've had it once before. <laughs> Thank God, only once. I'm going to have to kill Zoom, uh, restart, get my PowerPoint up, and then I'll be back in like hopefully just a minute or two. Okay. Okay. No problem. Thank you very much. So. Okay, so let's see what kind of questions do we have in the audience uh, while we wait for Professor Lewandowski to come back. And maybe you can share how you found it so far and um, what else would you like to talk I'm about? I'm actually back. Can okay, you... that was fast. <laughs> yes, it, uh, thank goodness, yes. So I just now have to restart. Um, um, I'm, I'm getting very close. Sorry about that. That's okay. So uh, it, it still does weird things. Hang on. Aha. Yeah, it's. Here we are now. Just a question while you restart. Uh, when the pause comes, do you want me to read the questions to you or do we, you want me to send you the questions directly and you take care of it? Um, you, can, uh, you can read it out loud. Um, okay, perfect. Yeah, we have a moderator that's filtering for me. He'll send it to me and I'll, I'll, I'll read them uh, to you. That sounds great now. And no problem. Take your time now. We'll have like five more minutes to compensate uh, for the technical issues. Okay. Now I'm sharing my entire screen. That seems to work. Can you see it? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. But it's got a lot of other stuff on it. So... I can no longer share my window. So what I'm gonna do is I will go to full screen. And now we should be pretty much where we were before. Is that yeah, correct? Linguistic landscape of science. Right, and you can see, okay, fantastic. Um, and I think I was actually at that slide before everything went, went wrong. Okay, Very well, okay. Uh, we recovered. Sorry about that. Um, nothing to better than to keep me on my toes. The other thing I should point out, ah, good, no, I, I do have access to the whole chat. Okay, I was worried I might lose that, but no, that is still there for later. So, right, I was at the point where I made the argument that climate scientists have been affected themselves by denial, not because they want to be, quite on the contrary. I have a great deal of respect for climate scientists. I work with them all the time, publish with them. Uh, and I know that they're under considerable pressure, pressure, political pressure, personal attacks, and so on. There's a whole story out there that's well documented in a number of books and articles. Um, but notwithstanding that, the linguistic landscape of science and the reticence that is inherent in science um, makes it very difficult, I think, for scientists to resist um, constant criticism, questioning, one-sided skepticism, attacks, and so on. Because as scientists, we're, we're used to responding to criticism. I mean, that's what it means to be a scientist, to say, yeah, oh, okay, hang on, I got to change my mind on that. 
Um, so it makes it, you know, scientists are a wonderful target if you want to change somebody's mind, even if you're acting uh, in, in bad faith. And it turns out that arguably some of the IPCC reports were um, conservative. It is also the case that scientists tend to be very concerned about being too alarmist. And if you're too concerned about being alarmist, well, then maybe, <laughs> you know, you're understating the case. Um, there's some quantitative evidence for that. Here is a text analysis of the, um, the language being used in official IPCC reports. Um, and in contrast to that, and uh, a contrarian product called the NIPCC, which is basically a smorgasbord of denialist talking points thrown together, um, but which is far more certain in what it has to say than the uh, IPCC report. In fact, the word uncertain or uncertainty occurs more than 2,000 times in the Working Group 1 report of the IPCC in 2013. And it hasn't changed since then, I don't think. So that is a, a background against which this sort of seepage can take place. By that, I mean that um, when scientists are under attack, being threatened, or feeling that they're accused of being elitist and all these other things that can be leveled at scientists, then in, psychologically speaking, it's entirely unsurprising that they might then retreat a little more than they should. Not because they want to, and they may not even know it, but it could happen. How do we know that it happened? Because this seepage, if it actually occurs, is extremely subtle and very difficult to capture. Now, my work has suggested, and I'm not making the point strongly because I can't, but I think we can detect evidence for seepage in the scientific literature itself. What I'm showing you here is an analysis of temperature slopes. So this is a histogram of trends over time for two types of trend, the blue histogram refers to the warming that was actually observed during the so-called pause in a corpus of more than 50 peer-reviewed articles on that pause. Now the pink histogram is warming at all other times since the onset of global warming in the 1970s standardized matched to precisely the same length of trends and precisely the same temperature product same data that was being used in the articles. So now have a look. The blue histogram is from articles who talk about a pause in global warming. The dotted vertical line is, um, it's getting increasingly mysterious. Um, I'm sorry, you can probably see that as well. The word just popped up, okay. <sighs> Wonder what else is gonna happen. Um, so the blue histogram relates to the trends that were observed in the data in papers that reported a pause in global warming. Well, if you look at the vertical that line, that zero trend, it turns out that in fact there was warming during the time that was called a pause in nearly all the papers. And only very few actually had a zero trend or negative trend. And it turns out that even at other times, in the pink histogram that was occasionally observable. So there was clearly a slowing of warming for like, you know, eight or 10 years. We now understand pretty much why that happened. Um, but at the time, scientists talked about a pause rather than a slowing in warming, which was the language used by contrarians. And that was, to my mind, imported into uh, the scientific community. And I have to catch up with a little bit of time, so I'll skip over this very quickly. But if you're really interested in this, uh, there is an agent-based Bayesian model of how this process works um, that can show how denial can slow acceptance of a consensus in the scientific community. It cannot abolish it, but it can slow it. 
And if they're disproportionately represented in public, then it can lastingly prevent the public from acquiring the scientific consensus position, which is precisely what we've observed. In fact, this model does capture what we've observed in the scientific community as well as the public, making some assumptions uh, about denial, one of which is that the agents are biased and not uh, updating their beliefs in a rational manner. Good, and that brings me to the end of the first segment, sadly, about the five minutes later that I lost about five minutes, I think, and I'm delayed no, by that. So, but anyway, let's answer some questions. And if need be, I can shorten my second segment. For sure. Like, we have we have a couple questions. We have about, I think, seven or eight questions. So okay. uh, let's, Go let's for get it. started. Uh, so Alexandria asks, uh, we often hear of freedom of speech and freedom of the press. What suggestions would you propose to maintain a, a balance between this freedom and the delivery of robust scientific data about climate science? Yeah, it's, it's, it's that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, I, I wish I had a clear answer to that. I think journalists have to learn uh, to apply a filter that is based on the balance of evidence, not the balance of opinion. And I think it's important to realize that um, whether there's freedom of speech or not, in the media, there's always a gatekeeper. There are always editors. It's always a judgment. The media do not randomly report everything. They can't. There's too much. They must apply a filter. And so really, the only question is, how are you going to filter this? You know, what filter do you apply? And I would suggest on scientific issues, or indeed, actually, any other issue, you should go with the balance of evidence, not the balance of opinion. Um, if Donald Trump says that his inauguration crowd was the biggest ever in history, well, that's just plain false. You know, it was just plain false. It was just cooked up. It was just, just you know, not the truth. So should the media say, oh, well, there's a balance of opinion here? No, I mean, you know, it's so obvious. It was so obvious. You just say that's false. He's making stuff up. Otherwise, you're not doing the public a favor. So I think that's there's a sort of a bit of a cultural uh, shift required there. Now, the other thing I'm going to do is, if you're really interested in this, um, I'll pop a link into the chat to a report that has nothing to do with climate change, but has everything to do with the interface between technology and democracy that I just wrote with colleagues last year for the European Union. Uh, the European Commission, and that reviews solutions as well as the problem that comes from social media not having gatekeepers and all that kind of stuff. So the bigger answer is in that report. Yeah, definitely relevant. Uh, Julianne asks, 900 million annual revenue is a lot, but mm -hmm. there is not even more money on the science side. How come the money spent on denial has a disproportionate effect when compared to the money spending spent on communicating science? Well, <laughs> the money that's spent on science is spent on doing science, not on doing propaganda. Uh, I mean, you know, yes, there's more money in science, quite possibly. Um, but they use that to, you know, go to Antarctica and drill ice cores and do research and hire postdocs. And, you know, I mean, they're doing that for science. <laughs> that costs a lot of money. That's for satellites. That's for, you know, science costs money. Uh, so when it comes to actually communicating things, then, uh, you know, the $900 million a year is, is purely for what I would call, well, propaganda or lobbying or, you know, opinion shaping. I mean, that's, that's what the money is for. That's why these conservative think tanks exist, is to develop policy proposals and talking points uh, 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 for whoever is paying them. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for that. And then we have also Mahot who asks, the fact that politics influence how funds are dispatched to scientists, must influence how well scientists want to endorse their discourse, may want to endorse the, the discourse, the, the government that's paying them, right? So how do we counteract this issue? Should funding be unrelated to topics and purely quota-based? Well, I'm, I, I'm not sure I grasp the question because the premise is false. Um, I mean, 
yes, certain governments spend more on science than other others. You know, I mean, that's true. Uh, uh, some government in some country will cut the budget for science, some other government will increase it. But the allocation of money within science is not usually, mainly not driven by political considerations. Governments often try to influence that, but in fact, it doesn't happen. Uh, for the most part, grant money in the United States and in the United Kingdom and in Australia and any other country I know of are allocated by granting panels that are composed of academics and allocate the money based on peer review. So uh, now I'm well aware of the fact that that's not a perfect system, that there are distortions in the system, um, but it's certainly not the case that the government of the day can, can just sort of say, oh, I want some other stuff and then expect to get it. Now, of course, there is a long history um, of Republican administrations in the United States trying to interfere with climate science, trying to uh, rewrite reports from scientists more to their liking. And that's well documented. Um, but it doesn't change the fundamental fact that even under Trump or George Bush, um, climate scientists were doing work that was very inconvenient to, to the government of the day. So fortunately, in most democratic countries, science is still <laughs> driven by merit rather than just politics. And I'm saying that in knowing full well that there, are, there is, of course, politics being played, but we've been lucky until now uh, to avoid that at least somewhat. Yes, thank you very much. Now we're going to Alexandro's question, uh, who says, you said it's easier to lower confidence in climate change than to increase it. Can you explain that con concept a little bit further? Yeah, okay. Well, that refers to this uh, meta-analysis, this review by Rode and colleagues that just came out. And they looked at a huge number of studies that try to influence people's climate attitudes in experiments. And they differentiated between studies that try to increase acceptance and those that try to lower it simply to see how damaging this information is. Now, in those experiments, what typically happens is that you know, people come in the lab or they're recruited online, they're given a questionnaire, um, with their climate attitudes, let's say. And then in some conditions, before they take the questionnaire, they're exposed to an intervention. Now, a positive intervention might highlight the scientific consensus or it might provide you know, a list of the endorsements of the premise of climate science by, by a scientific organization. So it might explain the evidence, whatever. It might try to, to boost people's acceptance of the science. So if you do that and compare it to a control condition in which nothing happens, then yes, you get an effect, but that effect is smaller than a comparison between the same control condition and another condition in which you're trying to trivialize climate change and say, oh, well, there is a pause. Oh, it's a hoax, you know. So dismissing climate change moves people further than trying to boost their attitudes. That's just an empirical description of regularity in the literature. Now, um, that can have a, a number of reasons. For example, it could be the case that most people are already convinced of climate change and therefore it's much harder to lift them further. That, that is one possible interpretation of, of the results. The other thing is that people may be, um, the other possible explanation is that people are more predisposed to dismiss climate change because of course it's inconvenient, right? I mean, who wants climate change? No one. It is just terrible, you know, who wants it? So if somebody tells me it's a hoax, great. <clears throat> it might be more appealing and more comforting to people right exactly so oh, yeah cool. better. you just told me it's a hoax that's great I yes. can fly <laughs> yeah i see okay thank you we have uh we're, we're maybe we can do two more then yes. follow the talk and then we'll keep the the rest of them for the end if that's okay with okay you. so m and dean is asking considering that a lot of people believe in the flat earth theory 
even if we have proof of the opposite, just like we have climate change deniers and climate change proof, how can scientists convince people that do not listen to scientific demonstrations that climate change exists? Yeah, well, that's another million dollar question. Um, I mean, first of all, if, if you step back and, and you think of climate change as a problem that needs to be solved, then you can solve the problem without everybody being convinced of the science. I mean, you know, if you're waiting for every single person in the world to be convinced, we'll never solve climate change because some people will never be convinced. Um, and it's not necessary. I mean, you know, there are people out there who think that smoking is good for you. And yet we were able to introduce tobacco control legislation. There are people out there who think that they can drive drunk. They're really good at it and they keep drinking and driving. And yet that hasn't stopped us from changing the culture and the legislation. So most people don't uh, drink and drive at the same time. So, um, you know, don't get too fixated on, on having to convince everybody. The crucial thing is to have policy action. Now, this is a whole separate talk uh, about how to generate uh, policy action. But, um, you know, in many ways, the policy steps that are involved don't even have to tackle climate change directly. You can get people to agree to subsidize clean, renewable energy for reasons that have nothing to do with climate change. So. There, there are ways in which you can move the needle on policy without having to worry too much about attitudes. Having said that, there is a huge literature on how to change people's attitudes and how to get them to listen to scientists. And, you know, that's another, that's another two or three talks. Thank you. Um, that's an interesting perspective. Like, let's stop trying to convince and more moving towards generating policies that will make people. Yeah. 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 Uh, Hugh, Hugh asks, is it not possible that the semantics of the contrarian literature is becoming more and more similar to those used in the news media and in both the presidential, presidential and congressional discourse in yeah. an attempt to gain an air of legitimacy? Yeah, so it's, an, it's an interesting question because all I, and I didn't have time to get into that. Could it be that the contrarians are just becoming more, more reasonable over time? Well, actually, no. Uh, there, there is another paper by Justin Farrell, which I didn't have time to talk about, and other analyses suggesting that actually over time, until you know a few years ago, which is when the research was done, there, there was absolutely no abatement or, or change in <clears throat> denialist discourse. Uh, a lot of people thought that, well, they're going to shift from denying the science to denying the solution. There was a little bit of that, but not much. In fact, most arguments against climate change haven't changed since the 1970s. There's still the exact same catalog, the same fallacies, the same talking points. Um, so on that basis, I'm, I'm inclined to rule out that possibility. But it's a very clever question, and it could have been the case. Thank you very much. So I think because we would still have okay. like 15 to 20 minutes for you to finish your conference and then maybe open for questions again. Okay, sure. I'm more than happy to take questions, but I do want to move on and now talk a little bit about the demand side. Uh, Fernanda, how much time should I take now? We've lost a little time. I don't know how much. I think uh, if you take 20 minutes for your conference, we'll have five oh, minutes for questions. Easy. Okay. I should be able to do that. Okay, let's get yeah. going. 20 minutes. If you do it a little bit shorter, we have more time for questions. Okay, no yeah, problem. Go ahead. The well, the point, <laughs> the point I want to make really is on this line. And that is that what makes people buy into climate denial is their worldview. By that I mean their attitudes towards free markets, their politics, their view of how the world should operate. What I'm showing you here are actually synthetic data, but it's precisely the correlation coefficient. Uh, of minus 0.7 that we've observed in one of our studies at the uh, latent variable level. The more people endorse free market economics, the less likely they are to accept the physics of climate science. Now, that is pervasive. And as it turns out, and this makes it very easy to talk about it, the precise measure of worldview doesn't matter. In the US, you can talk about Republicans versus Democrats. 
you can measure conservatism, you can measure other constructs such as social dominance orientation or egalitarianism or whatever you want to call it. Anything that kind of measures people's fundamental politics will give you the same result. And it will give you the same result all across the world. Um, Here's a study from 2015 showing that climate skepticism, so-called, is greater among older conservative males, you know, pale male and stale, that's sort of the, the classic climate denier, uh, people who look like me. Um, and here's another study by Hornsey and colleagues looking at 24 countries, and you get precisely the same thing. These are effect sizes. They're greatest in the US, uh, quite large across English uh, speaking countries, and still significant if you look at all 24 countries as a whole. And, uh, you know, that's just <laughs> the way the way it is. Uh, I think there's there's fundamentally no doubt about that finding. And worldview is more important than other variables. And this is where it gets to be a little more interesting because we're now moving out of the you know, just purely a correlation. We're now moving into uh, interactions with other variables. For example, education. Now, among Democrats in the US, the more educated they are, they are the more they will accept that climate change exists and is a problem. Among Republicans, the opposite happens. The more educated uh, Republicans are, the less they will endorse uh, climate science. This is shown here again in graphical form by with two studies by Larry Hamilton. The one on the right um, shows how for liberals education leads to greater acceptance and for conservatives there is a slight decline. On the left it is self-declared knowledge. The more Democrats know about climate change, the more concerned they are, the more Republicans say uh, that they understand global warming, the less concerned they are. And there are no Republicans who say they don't understand at all. So you get this bifurcation. More information, more education, more knowledge sometimes can make things worse. What I mean by worse is polarization uh, between the parties or political camps. As I said before, <laughs> don't matter whether you call them Democrats or Republicans or liberals, conservatives, you know, however way you, whichever way you measure it, you get the same result. And it's not just attitudes, it is even perception of the world around us. Here's another study by Larry Hamilton done in New Hampshire, asking uh, people of different political colors to, to indicate whether they think that flooding in their home state has increased in the past 10 years. Now, among liberals, nearly half of people think that. Among conservatives, one fifth. Big difference in percentage points here. What is really happening in the state? Well, these are the extreme precipitation data for various different consecutive decades. And what you can see here is that there's been a dramatic increase of extreme precipitation events and the flooding that follows from that. So even the perception of our world that we live in is governed uh, by worldview. And that has consequences downstream because what then happens is if your worldview is basically mandating that you must reject climate science, then how are you going to handle the fact that all the scientists, virtually all the scientists, agree that the evidence is overwhelming? Well, one way in which to get out of that problem is to just say, these guys are involved in a conspiracy. And unsurprisingly, there is now a fairly large literature on this that people who endorse conspiracy theories are <laughs> always rejecting scientific reasoning. I have yet to find somebody who is a conspiracy theorist on the one hand, but on the other hand, at the same time, is also saying, oh yeah, vaccinations are really good because they're keeping people alive. Well, you're not gonna find that. You're gonna find somebody who believes in conspiracy theories will say that vaccines are a hoax and Bill Gates is implanting microchips uh, when you get a jab against COVID. That's pervasive. Here is um, 
a um, summary of some of the data uh, from various different experiments. These are all correlations. They're all negative, meaning that uh, the more people endorse conspiracies, the less they will accept the scientific propositions that I'm mentioning here. It's even true for nanotechnology and the link between HIV and AIDS, smoking and lung cancer. It is, it is really pervasive. Now, why? Um, well, on the one hand, there are some people who are just prone to that. Uh, and there's some evidence for that based on personality research, based on the fact that people who believe in one conspiracy are also believing in others. Um, but there's also, I think, that pragmatic route, um, namely that's a response to a threat to one's worldview, which is how I started out. I said, well, hang on, you have this ideology, it's mandating a certain attitude. Now you learn that all the scientists agree Ooh, what am I going to do? It's a hard sell for me to say I know more than the scientist. I mean, some people do that, but it's a little harder to say that than it is to say, oh, the scientists are in it for the grant money. Now, that's the flow chart of the process I've just outlined. Um, and the proposition, the hypothesis I want to advance is that there is this pragmatic route to conspiracism where people deploy a conspiracy theory, uh, not because they're disposed towards conspiracy theorizing, but because it gets them out of this bind of being confronted with a strong scientific consensus. Now, I'm going to walk you through one study that I just published a few weeks ago, a few months ago, maybe, um, where we, we try to get at this pragmatic deployment of conspiratorial thought. And what happened in the study is that I would ask people to estimate the scientific consensus with questions such as, out of 100 climate scientists, how many do you think believe that CO2 causes climate change? I did that for climate change, but also for vaccinations and the link between HIV and AIDS. And having, having asked that, <coughs> I then turned around and said, hey, by the way, Virtually all scientists agree on the link between HIV and AIDS or climate change or vaccinations. And then I asked, well, how much do the following reasons contribute to this agreement? And I gave a bunch of reasons and people in the experiment had to simply indicate how much of that contributed to the consensus. Now, I presented them with six different options, five of which were hinting at a conspiracy. Of course, this is just an abbreviation of what subjects actually saw. They saw a much sort of, you know, longer description of what's going on. But this gives you the sense, you know, it's like scientists following the money, succumbing to groupthink. That's a favorite one. Political pressure, pursuit of an agenda, et cetera, et cetera. And only one of the options was what I would consider to be the most likely reason, which is that the scientists look at the evidence and come to a conclusion. Now, here are the data. And I need to spend a minute to explain the graph because it's a wee bit complicated. I'm plotting correlations between conservatism and the endorsement of a presumed reason for the consensus. Now, I call it conservatism because it's just easy. I could have called it liberalism then the correlations would flip and nothing else would change. Um, it's just easier to score as conservatism. Now, the gray dots are non-significant. As you can see, for AIDS, there's nothing. Politics doesn't matter, not one bit. Now, for the same people, same participants, this is the pattern for climate change. All hell breaks loose. All of a sudden, the more conservative you are, the more you think that the conspiratorial reasons are responsible for the consensus of the scientists, and the less you think that evaluation of evidence is relevant. Now, that's a big effect. Vaccinations, similar, but slightly reduced. Um, now, what does that mean? Well, first of all, let me map it onto other data that show the correlation between 
attitudes towards climate change and conservatism or anti-vaccination attitudes. And those correlations, the magnitude of those correlations maps beautifully into this disentanglement between the conspiratorial reasons and the scientific reason, suggesting that uh, politics matters to the extent that it determines attitudes. And in this case, it deploys conspiratorial rhetoric to a proportionate extent. That's how I interpret these data. And to complete the picture, let me also show you another plot that's almost the same, but it is now plotting uh, people's dispositional conspiracism and how that correlates with endorsement of these various different reasons for the consensus. And now the pattern changes. Now there's a huge effect of conspiracism on vaccinations. And there's one on AIDS. It matters when it comes to AIDS, how conspiratorial you are in general. But for climate change, it's actually much smaller. And again, the extent to which you get this division between science and conspiracy maps beautifully into the known effect of conspiracism on attitudes towards those scientific propositions. So within the same people, you can detect a conspiratorial endorsement based on their politics for climate change, but not based on their politics for AIDS, while at the same time, the conspiracism disposition matters more for AIDS than climate change and so on, okay? Now, to me, that means that uh, when rejection of science is mandated by political views, the scientific consensus is explained through conspiracy because it's a get out of jail for free card. This actually meshes well with some other work that John Cook and I have done where we show that um, among people who are opposing climate change for political reasons, telling them about the consensus makes them trust the scientists less. Why? Well, perhaps because they're thinking they're all engaged in a conspiracy. I'll skip over this for, uh, to save time. These were just illustrations of what I just said. I do, however, want to focus on the broader fallout from conspiracism, which is that mere exposure to conspiracy theories reduces one's intention to reduce carbon footprint or to engage in politics. It also reduces trust in government institutions. So conspiracy theories, even if you don't believe them, being exposed to them, having them articulated has adverse consequences. And if you're interested in this, uh, I uh, published a uh, handbook on conspiracy theories earlier, about a year ago, that's available now in 12 different languages. You can look it up at the link I just popped into the chat if you wanna know more about conspiracy theories. So that's my last slide. Um, Denial of climate change, to my mind, is an entirely rational exercise. It's not a scientifically valid position, by all means. I mean, it, it just has no scientific validity. But it's totally coherent and um, a beautiful political position because um, through denial, you are keeping things the way they are. You're keeping at bay regulation or taxes. You can pursue libertarianism. Uh, if that's your political goal, then denial is doing its job fantastically well. And even though denial often involves conspiratorial rhetoric, as you know, Donald Trump saying that global warming is a hoax invented by the Chinese, well, that, that isn't irrational. <laughs> if you consider the fact that it is a wonderful get out of jail for free card because you don't have to worry about climate change. So to my mind, and as I've shown in the last study, even this conspiratorial rhetoric is completely rationally deployed. So um, that's my bottom line. Denial is all sorts of things, but it's definitely not uh, irrational.